we were working in many different settings when COVID hit. And what we learned was not only the inequity of um, who became ill, but also the inequity in our system with who was able to work from home, who was able to telehealth, and the effect that it had on many folks like the direct care staff that were in facilities 24 seven, and most importantly, the individuals that were receiving care in congregate settings during, during, um, during COVID. So today we're really excited to bring those perspectives um, and to bring those voice to light. So today we'll be talking about perspectives and experiences from inpatient and individuals in congregate settings um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome, and I'm gonna turn this over to Amanda Sake who will kick off our program and um, introduce our panels and speakers. So Amanda, thank you very much and welcome. Sure, hi, thank you. Um, as, as Joan said, my name is Amanda Sake. I'm special assistant to the commissioner and I oversee the Office of Consumer Affairs um, at the New York State Office of Mental Health. Uh, today, I'll be co-facilitating the session with Nanette Larson, who's the deputy director of wellness and recovery services for the Illinois Department of Human Services Division of Mental Health. You know, last March changed uh, life for all of us. Um, and those, for those residing in hospitals and other residential facilities uh, faced and had to adapt to significant challenges you know, to avoid the spread of the virus, many services and daily routines um, individuals were accustomed to changed drastically. In our work, we've been so impressed by the resiliency of the individuals we serve and the staff, um, how folks came together to uh, overcome the challenges has been inspiring. And you'll see that resiliency and inspiration in action in the panelist presentation. So in today's session, we will hear the experiences and perspectives from individuals residing in inpatient and congregate settings during the pandemic from New York and Illinois. The focus will be on what will make a difference uh, to assure all feel physically and psychologically safe during unprecedented times. We're also hoping that through hearing their experiences and perspectives, we can have some key takeaways that can help shape our system of care moving forward. You know, we're so honored and grateful for the panelists today who will be sharing their experiences um, and for the leadership and staff who've championed and supported their participation in today's event. And to prepare for today's town hall, we asked the panelists to reflect on the following questions uh, as they prepared their remarks. The first question is, how did it feel when the pandemic first started affecting the day-to-day -day activities in the hospital? What COVID-related changes uh, made life in the hospital better? What COVID-19 related challenges made life in the hospital more challenging? Uh, what were the interactions like between the staff and patients at the hospital during this time? And is there anything that you'd like to tell uh, other states that you think would be helpful when implementing changes uh, for the safety of the patients and staff? And we stated that that doesn't necessarily have to be specific to the pandemic. And with that, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to Tony Trahan, who's the Deputy Director of the Office of Consumer Affairs at the New York State Office of Mental Health, who will introduce the panelists from Long Island and New York. We'll then pass the ball to Nanette Larson, who will facilitate the discussion with the panelists from Illinois. We'll then hand the mic back over to Tony, who will introduce the panelists in Rochester, New York, and then we'll open the floor for Q&A uh, with the panelists um, after their presentation. So with that, Tony. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you all for, uh, for inviting us here today. And you know, I want to say thank you to Sue uh, Pylon from uh, Pilgrim Psychiatric Center uh, for helping to coordinate this with the patients at the psychiatric center. So we're going to hear from three people from Pilgrim. Uh, Pilgrim's located in Long Island, New York. Uh, we have Shanice Williams, Tommy D, and Michael A, who are going to uh, each uh, take uh, roughly five minutes to uh, uh, to to give you their perspective and their experience. So up first, we have Shanice Williams, and he's going to be telling um, a brief version of his recovery story, and then he's going to address the uh, questions that Amanda just alluded to. So I will switch it over to Pilgrim. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to use two quotes just to break the ice. Uh, my uh, sobriety has been, since 1999, my choice of drug, I haven't used cocaine, 
in that many years, about 23, 22 years. That was my choice of drug. Uh, alcohol, I haven't used since 2006. And I used to love alcohol. I started off with it, but, um, you know, I think 15 years is pretty good without, the, you know, being sober. Um, okay, this is one quote I like to say. Without a struggle, there is no progress. Sometimes instead of going over the brick wall, you have to go through it. I'm just going to give you two now, maybe a couple after I finish my presentation. Okay, uh, let's see. How it, how it felt when the pandemic first started affecting the day-to-day -day activities in the hospital? It was like very scary, you know. Um, it, it was like a different world. I remember watching the news and they said pandemic, and I never heard that word before. I heard epidemic, but not pandemic. And uh, one of the um, staff told me, he said, pandemic is like worldwide. So now I got some wisdom off of that. Um, 24 hours of people just saying on the news, oh man, um, thousands and thousands of people were dying. It was very uh, heartfelt for me because I didn't have nobody, but I was thinking about just people dying in general. Um, Okay, um, yeah, and uh, that's it for question one. Question two is COVID related changes made life in the hospital better? Bleach, a lot of bleach. <laughs> Every minute, you know, the staff is bleaching the counters, the, the doorknobs, the counters, everything. They did a real good job with that. Uh, we had uh, six feet apart, you know, social distancing. Uh, we washed our hands more. They told us to wash it. So your ABCs that long, you know. Um, wearing masks. A lot of people were wearing masks. At first, people wasn't wearing masks because at the time of the pandemic, it was uh, probably flu season and staff was basically wearing masks. Some people had to wear masks. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, it was like, okay, we where's our mask at? We need masks too. Then we started wearing masks. Um, and uh, let's see, get into the dorm area. Yeah, it, you know, to take a break from everybody and everything, we went in the dorm area to social distance also. Uh, number three, COVID-related changes made life in the hospital more challenging. Uh, not being able to visit my family, um, you know, that was very hard for me. Um, I used to get visits every day, every week, excuse me, but, uh, you know, I really missed that a lot. Uh, the movement of uh, the cause of COVID, no movement because of the COVID virus. We couldn't go to program or anything like that. That made that very challenging. Uh, it seemed like the pandemic would never end, and that's what I have for that one. Question four, interactions between staff and patients at the hospital during this time? Uh, staff was... Pleasurable, you know, they were really talking to us and, you know, telling how life was supposed to be right. on the outside and the inside. So they would give us a scoop on the outside because we wasn't there. We just saw it on TV and it was like a reality check when you talk to staff. Right. Um, uh, yeah, and, you know, music, that really started everything. You know, as soon as we started listening to music, it like brought us together. It was like a universal flow, you know. Um, Question five, anything you would like to tell other states that you would be helpful helpful when implement, excuse me, implementing changes for the safety of all staff and patients? Uh, this is a big one. Um, I say hands-on, I've been here for two years. We need more staff on the, on the units. If, uh, right now we're working with three staffs on the unit. If we had four or five, it would be better. Um, you know, things would run, run much smoother. Um, you know, it would cut down arguments. It would cut down uh, fights and all things that, you know, come along with 25, 23 grown men being together. Um, yeah, and even more groups. Um, that would be a good thing with the therapy assistance. You know, more groups them teaching us stuff about the outside world related to COVID. And uh, that's it for my presentation. So I just give you two more quotes and then I end and give it to my brothers right here. Um, to win 100 battles and 100 victories is not the highest skill. The highest skill is to subdue the enemy without fighting. This one I, I just got, uh, it's pretty good. It's, it's like, you know, containing me a little bit too. Uh, don't do something permanently stupid because you are permanently upset. So that's my presentation. Thank you for everybody for 
listening in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. I really appreciate it. Very good. All right. So our next person is Tommy D. And he's going to be speaking about his experience on two different units during the pandemic. Tommy. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and I would like to say good afternoon to the National Association of uh, Mental Health Program Directors, honored guests and panelists. Uh, my name is Tommy D. I'm a client with six years of recovery at Pilgrim Psychiatric Center Hospital in Long Island, New York. I've served honorably nine years in the United States Army, and my mental health diagnosis is schizophrenia paranoid type. My experience with the COVID-19 pandemic started in to affect day-to-day -day activities at the hospital around March 13, 2020. Lost a lot of freedom where I was quarantined with my fellow clients to the hospital assigned ward. It felt like jail or being suffocated but, and the information being disseminated in the early stage of the pandemic to me and fellow clients from New York State Office of Mental Health and Pilgrim Psychiatric Center was slow to come by with a, a, a lot of mandated strict rules to follow. There was no protective mask for clients due to shortage with high demand in area community hospitals being overwhelmed and the powers that be thought all clients were safe from COVID being quarantined to hospital wards. The frontline therapy aides, nurses, and professional staff were, were wearing issued protective masks. The thought that the staff employees went out back to the communities where they lived and could bring virus to all the clients inside the hospital if they didn't wear protective masks. All visits by family and friends canceled to further notice. No groups, no programs like greenhouse and barn filled with animals to attend and volunteer work stopped. Furloughs and day passes stopped immediately. Had to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner on client assigned ward. 26 clients cramped between several rooms Plus dorm living quarters open 24 hours, seven days a week for a year. Everyone was cautious about hugs and shaking hands, washing hands routinely to keep safe distance among fellow clients and staff not to get COVID virus. Watch news every day for New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo daily news conference about COVID-19 pandemic related information. Early May 2020, shift in policy for the good of all clients to receive protective masks to wear at all times except inside your living quarters. Talked on telephone with loved ones and trying to keep in touch and to cope together through the pandemic crisis. Past time writing and reading newspapers, magazines, watching Netflix movies on DVD player to video games on Xbox. Had a lot of fresh air time in Pilgrim center numerous yards during daylight and night, depending on staff commitment and requirements. Changes that made the hospital better was the introduction of iPads and tablets with online face-to-face -face time with family and friends. I'd like to thank Tony Trahan of New York State Office of Mental Health, Deputy Director of Consumer Affairs, was instrumental in advocating for the high-tech devices like the iPads and tablets with more computers with online apps to link with Office of Mental Health through WebEx. Plus, living quarters open 24-7 during the pandemic to keep crime <clears throat> spread out throughout the ward. Pilgrim Psychiatric Director of Operations gave all wards important updates about COVID-19 pandemic. Housekeeping, maintenance, bleaching and sterilizing for bacteria and germs like the telephone doorknobs on all doors, walls, desk surfaces, the bathrooms, and other related rooms. Housekeeping was also wearing protective garments for face shields, protective masks, and gloves. For the better, the hospital introduced COVID-19 rapid test kits with Q-tips to the nose, which were not intrusive with tongue with a time result of 15 minutes. The Pfizer two-shot vaccine was little to no side effects, also protected against the COVID virus. One-to-one -one therapy by psychologists on ward to cope COVID restrictions related issues of concern. 
the doctors, nurses, and th therapy aides, housekeeping and professional staff and administration, hard work through the pandemic, job well done. Hospital with more challenging, with no structured groups or programs, no furloughs, plus no day passes, no community trips, no visits by family or friends, the hug and kiss. Keeping calm, but coping with mandated COVID restrictions, rules to follow. If you tested positive COVID virus, you had to be quarantined to an overflow ward for strict observation, not to infect or other clients and staff. Very traumatic for everyone feeling hopeless to help. The interactions between staff and clients was tense at the early stage because the hard line to enforce restrictive rules in quarantine environment. A lot of freedom and liberties were taken for granted during the pandemic. The relations got better due to seriousness of the death toll in New York State and the rest of the country. We worked as a team united to survive the virus together. The front, the front line in the trenches, state employees and professionals and administration had the same fears for themselves as their loved ones, as clients. Grown to be one happy family to be there for each other. I'd like to tell the National Association of Mental Health Program Directors the COVID rapid test kit with 15 minute results and the Pfizer two shot vaccine were game changers. Very important to protect, to practice protective medicine to keep from spreading the virus. Looking back on the restrictive approach of the lockdown of the wards in the hospital, absolutely necessary to keep a lot of clients alive and safe, especially clients with pre-existing conditions. I was against uh, the lockdowns, but <laughs> I've grown to accept it and I know it was very important to save lives. And I would like to recognize and acknowledge the Director of Operations, Dr. Steve Berg of Pilgrim Psychiatric Center for his meritorious service of 35 years to the state of New York. On behalf of present and former clients, plus all the families you have touched with compassion, devotion, professionalism, and kindness, especially through the COVID pandemic crisis with straight talk candor. Thank you, enjoy retirement, you've earned it. Thank you, thank you very much, Tommy. Uh, so we're gonna bring uh, Michael uh, in here, Michael, uh, Michael A. Uh, and we have some of his uh, some of his drawings. Uh, Michael is going to speak about his recovery story, and he's going to focus on how he used art uh, to help him during the quarantine. And then he also wants to discuss how certain hospital policies also helped him. So, Michael. All right. Hello, my name is Michael Ahern. I'm currently receiving treatment for a dual diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder and substance addiction here at Pilgrim State. After being in Manhattan State Civil Hospital for two months in 2020, the pandemic hit. At this point in time, I was talking with my legal counsel about transferring to Pilgrim State. However, it was at this time that I had to shelter in place in the city. The pandemic first became real to me when arriving the elevator with a clinician I had come to respect. When asking her simply how severe is a pandemic, she could not offer any comforting words. The eight months I spent at Manhattan State, we were quarantined to the ward for most of the time. I credit this to being the major reason COVID-19 did not sweep through our, my hospital ward. Shortly after the pandemic hit, the daily schedule resembled a prolonged nap for my fellow patients and I. We would wake up, eat breakfast, sleep. Wake up, eat lunch, sleep. This, this schedule quickly took a toll on me, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Depression easily set in with the daily rundown from our governor on the TV. Prior to being admitted to Manhattan State from Kirby Forensic Hospital, I had cemented the act of drawing as a major coping skill in my recovery. Not knowing what lay ahead day to day, drawing became my remedy. I started to draw patients after asking permission. I gave them artwork to send home to their family or keep for themselves, while others left their artwork to me in order for me to remember them by. As I continued to draw, therapy aides began to take more and more notice of the work. 
I was doing, and soon after became my subject as well. I gave these drawings of the staff to them in an effort to express the gratitude I felt for the work that they do. I felt and still feel today that um, the uh, therapy aides don't get enough credit for the work they do in the OMH, uh, OMH system. Their response to the COVID epidemic made this fact certain. As the pandemic carried on, even things like playing cards became dangerous. I thank God that I had connections to family and friends in and outside of recovery. At this time, I had already been developing a strong relationship with my sponsor from AA. We were introduced over the phone when a mutual friend put us in contact. He got in contact with me shortly after his son had a bipolar break. I was able to help him understand recovery in the mental health system. And very soon after, we began the fellowship over the phone and through visits. I, felt, I feel that I'm extremely blessed to have the support from a sponsor that not only has over 20 years of sobriety, but also a knowledge of mental illness firsthand due to his son's diagnosis. I know that this is no ordinary connection and is a relationship to be nurtured. I was finally able to transfer to Pilgrim State Hospital during a, a downswing in the positivity rates this past fall. I was hours closer to family and my support network and everything seemed to be going to plan. Around Thanksgiving, after feeling symptoms like the flu, my roommate and I were both diagnosed with COVID-19. A num number of other patients on my admissions ward were also diagnosed, and all of us were quarantined to our bedrooms for 14 days. We were let out 20 minutes a day to call our family when the halls were empty at night. Luckily, I had a friendly roommate. We learned about each other and played cards, card games at certain times to keep a daily schedule. Once again, drawing became my outlet. Self-portraits and drawings of simple things like my dinner tray came to represent a time period we can all relate to from our own emotions and coping skills from COVID-19. Soon after my 14-day quarantine, I was put up for transfer to the privileged ward here at uh, Pilgrim. The second wave hit shortly after I transferred, and winter landscapes from my windows began to fill my idle time. For the most part, we were confined to the ward, and these landscapes began to represent a specific time and emotion concerning the winter of the spirit created by COVID-19. The start of groups, again, coincided with the start of spring. I began drawing more and more outside, and soon after receiving privileges like my own paint set, the grayscale drawing blossomed into colorful paintings. Art has brought me close to people I might have never connected with otherwise. It has also allowed me to grow in many ways that are sensitive to the time and place these artworks have come to represent. I'm hopeful as I continue on my road to recovery within the hospital that we as a community here will grow and heal from the COVID era. I also hope that we as a society can all come through this, this um, more aware and sensitive to our own personal mental health and our own personal coping skills and realize the importance of community in this worldwide time of recovery. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so that does it for uh, Pilgrim Psychiatric Center. Thanks again uh, for our panelists and for uh, Susan for helping to facilitate this. And I will pass it over to, I believe, Amanda or Nanette. Uh, Nanette. But thank you to the Pilgrim panelists. That was beautiful. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much to the Pilgrim panelists. Uh, you did such a fantastic job and I am honored to be here today. My name is Nanette Larson. Uh, I serve as Deputy Director for Wellness and Recovery Services in Illinois. And I am here today with individuals receiving services in uh, two of the state hospitals here in Illinois. Uh, we have a few individuals who will be speaking. Um, we will hear first from uh, Markeisha Wells at Elgin Mental Health Center, and then we will go uh, to another site and hear from uh, two individuals, uh, Carell Robinson and Charles Brown at Chicago Reed Mental Health Center. So first we'll start with Markeisha. Markeisha, go ahead. Hey everybody. Um, I would just like to thank everyone that made this possible. May you learn and grow from this. Um, 
how the pandemic was handled here at EMHC. Um, the first question was when the pandemic first started affecting the day to day activities in the hospital, what was it like for me? It was difficult to grasp knowing that it had taken over the world so quickly. Watching the news and knowing that people were passing away was devastating. I kind of knew that I was safer in the facility than anywhere else because the way the EMHC employees tackled the COVID-19, even though there was a hot spot at Cook County Jail and we were still receiving clients from Cook County Jail, we still remain basically pretty much safe. Um, number two, what COVID related changes made life in the hospital better? Everything that administration implemented, wearing masks, goggles, shields, gloves, robes, sanitizing everything from chairs, armrests, phones, doorknobs, tables, hands, countertops at the medication window after each patient and handouts from social workers and nurses about stress and COVID-19 related symptoms. We had donations from our STAs, which are security therapist aides that work very closely with us. We had donations of movies and games we would play in small group settings. They would play music for us to relax us when we were bored. Um, they even started video visitation, which was awesome. We could actually see our families so we couldn't visit with them. You know, they did that for the whole facility. Number three, what COVID related changes made life in the hospital more challenging? Social distancing was difficult when you were in close quarters with so many individuals. Exercising in groups at the gym and weight room ceased. Central activities at the groups and groups ended temporarily. Our COVID spring and October dances, we had co-ed dances that we would take pictures and send home to our families. We couldn't do that last year. We'd have a spring dance for Earth Day and we would celebrate with punch and, and whatever treats they would like to give us and we would dance with each other and talk. And, and, and in October, we would do Halloween costumes and take pictures or just dress up real nice and send them to our family. That really hurt us that year. Um, chairs were put six feet away from each other. Leisure was a no-go for a year. No visitation, no court. It could have caused confusion among patients, but thank goodness we were in good hands. We had a lot of people to talk to. They touched base with us. They talked to us and make sure we're okay. You know, um, the staff, as far as the nurses, the nurse managers, everybody. How would you describe the interactions between staff and patients at the hospital as these changes were being made? They took the older sibling role, I, I explain it that way, um, and was very attentive to our many needs. Every employee told us what was going on outside the hospital and how important it was to be state safe. Clean your hands after your meals and before and take showers daily, sanitize, do all these things wipe your doorknobs off, uh, wipe the phone off after you finish using it. Um, every employee told us how uh, to be safe there. They um, sanitized where we sat and where we ate and it made us feel safer. Okay, this is what I would like to say to the other states. EMHC went into emergency mode and was well prepared. Testing and vaccines came to us promptly. Temperatures were taken twice per shift. Doctors were always available to talk to day and night if we had any problems. Keeping us COVID free was top priority and we saw that. Our opinions always mattered. Clients were asked to vote on what should reopen first, what was top priority in the hospital, like the gym or the library, all those things. Tom Zubek was always available to ask questions, answer questions as well as Bob Price. Though the religious leaders weren't able to have meetings, Bob Price made sure that we had stations that we could watch or listen to for services. So he um, made sure we got, and Mark, <laughs> and Mark is awesome. He could talk to you for hours about recovery. He's just so wonderful. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. So we we I looked on the station. He called me, Bob Price, and um he said, look, we need to get these stations together for uh, uh religious services. So look on your TV and see what stations you get for religious services. So I I wrote them all down and gave it to him, and then it the whole community had them. Um, and also voting was made simplified for us. And I would like to say, if there is ever a time to receive any incentive for being vaccinated, it's now. Thank you. Markeisha Wells from MHC. Thank you, Markeisha. Beautifully done. We appreciate you very much. And, uh, and thank you to Bob Price and Mark Klosik, uh, Recovery Support Specialist at Elgin Mental Health Center for your support in, um, in during the pandemic and also in uh, uh, pulling this together today. Next, we're going to uh, Chicago Reed Mental Health Center where we will hear from Carell Robinson and Charles Brown. Carell, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, the changes made life better in the hospital for me was knowing that somebody cared about our health. Not only cared about our health, but theirs also because they was going in and out of the, out of the hospital and they had to be around that COVID situation that's been plagued our, our entire world. And it was easy for them to bring it back, but they chose not to socialize as much as they would if it hadn't been for COVID. COVID made my life miserable at first. Not only did uh, I have uh, nightmares about it, I also had family members to pass from me and also pass from other things and I wasn't able to go to the funerals. And uh, that was hard. But I persevered and got over that because it was something big, it was a bigger picture going on and that COVID is what really stopped everything as far as we know as normal. If it hadn't been for the COVID, I would have been out because I was coming up for a conditional release and the court system shut down. They stopped having in-person court. And it was a while before they got to having the FaceTime and the Zoom court. And by that time, it had got worse. And the challenging part about being in the hospital is you can't be around your loved ones or your friends and attend your religious services like you want to and go and come as you please. They shut down the hub and the club here at Chicago Reed and we couldn't go off the unit. We, I only been off the unit in a year only one time and that was when they started the visitation back up. I had a visit, thank God, my friend come out to see me and I was able to visit with her. So I felt I felt better after that. Before I was down, it, it kind of had me a little slight way depressed, but I went into a mode where I was suicidal or homicidal. I was just sorry for the situation I was in being in here during the COVID, I think was uh, the best thing for me because a lot of people was out there dying. They was dropping like flies here and across seas. And uh, I think that everybody had to rearrange their priorities and step up to being what all they can be as far as dealing with this pandemic. 
So, um, yeah, it was it was very challenging. The interaction between the staff and the patient was somewhat business as usual. It wasn't nothing special they did except keep us safe from getting the virus and still attending to our needs and our wants as far as our uh, going to church. Uh, they let me watch the television at 6.30 in the morning for my religious program. And I, that was a blessing because I think without that, I couldn't get through as well as I did. We had one uh, patient on the unit that he would keep my blood pressure up. And uh, we finally got rid of him and my blood pressure went back to normal. But I was still sad about the situation, not being able to see relatives and family as far as our visitation and getting off the unit, going to shoot pool, going to groups and stuff like that. And I would like to say to the states, the other states, that they're doing a great job here at Chicago Reed. I hope they're doing a good job where you at too, because all lives matter. And it's not just a black and white thing. It's a people thing. And if you don't have compassion for others, nobody will have compassion for you. And the staff here showed us compassion as well as respect during this pandemic because we was shown how to stay our distance, wear our masks and wash our hands by their example. So I'm glad that we had the staff we have here during this pandemic because it's very important that we have people in, in positions to show us the things to do that we're not able to do that's going on outside of these walls. So it's important that staff and the patient have a, some kind of understanding whereas if you help me, I help you. And the staff showed us that. And we was able to keep safe and only had one outbreak on the unit since the pandemic started. And we haven't had any serious cases that needed to go to the hospital. So I want to shout out to the staff here at Chicago Reed. You're doing a wonderful job and keep up the good work. And with that, I'll pass it over to my counterpart, Charles Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a nice day. Uh, my name is Charles Brown. Um, how did the pandemic first affect me? Uh, day activities at the hospital. Well, I would say um, it affected me in, in, in such a way. You know, it was uh, I was on my way walking out the door. You know, just to the point of uh, on a discharge. Uh, all I had to do was go to court. It stopped my uh, packet, my, my, uh, my packet from going in. It stopped my, uh, it stopped my progress. You know, my progress and my process from going through. And um, I had to stay in. You know, I had to stay in, and I was upset. Um, but I, I overlooked it, and uh, I said, you know, uh, maybe there's a reason why I'm stuck in here. You know what I'm saying? There's a reason for everything. You know. Um, you know, it wasn't a rush for me to get out there. And I see that it wasn't a rush for me to get out there because uh, it was very tragic, uh, some tragic things going on. Um, it got worse, you know, um, no courts. Uh, uh, the hospital still still for a minute, no movement, no groups. We weren't doing groups, you know. Um, that's what keeps us busy. That's what's keeping us uh, motivated. And uh, we weren't having groups. We weren't having uh, 
wasn't doing nothing with no structural anything, but just watching TV. So it became to get boring from time to time to a point where it's uh, you know, uh, it was it was it was down and out and depressed mode started to kick in. So uh, eventually, after about nine months, you know, then we say um, they they uh, they started up um, um, OT um, little activities that we can do. That's probably pretty much when uh pandemic was settling down. Uh, about to clear up a little bit. But overall, you know, we was uh, we was we was stuck, you know, we were, we was trying to tolerate everybody. We, we still got some people here. We, we still got some people here that's uh going through the situation as far as can't can't cannot deal with uh cannot deal with uh the COVID. Ready to go home. Um, how uh, related changes in my life? How hospital better and in, in hospital better? Um, I could say um, when you got the good book on your side, you know. When you got the good book on your side, you, you can you can make it through anything, and you know you, it, it builds up hope. You got friends around you you can talk to. It uh, kind of uh, soothed the situation a little bit. When you got nice staff, compassion staff, uh, is uh, very patient with you. Uh, is 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 it it's really uh, give you the moments to uh, to to appreciate them and others around you, and it make you feel better throughout the whole day. Can't do too much. You might do a little exercise, but some places you can't go nowhere uh, and do exercise. When they uh, confine you to one unit, you know what I'm saying? You're just stuck on one unit, then you know you just uh, you have to manage. And then you got the uh, certain people uh, caught with COVID up in here. We got about uh, three, three, four people caught the COVID in here and. Uh, you know, they, they almost shut us down to just stand in our rooms. You know what I'm saying? So uh, it, was, it was rough. It was rough. We was trying to maintain, trying to stay uh, COVID free. Well, but they managed. They came, They turned out all right. They survived. So we was happy about that. You know, um, uh, we, uh, we rejoice. We had a we had a party, a pizza party, but it wasn't too big because because of the COVID. Um, um, any related any COVID related changes made in my life at the hospital uh, challenging made more challenging. Well, um, I just say being patient with myself. You know, being patient with my doctor because I talk to him pretty much on uh, every month or uh, every two weeks. I was talking to him, and um, you know, I, I was hearing good news and I was hearing bad news and good news. You know, we got to wait for the COVID to clear up. You know what I'm saying? That was the bad news <laughs> to to start stuff back up. You know what I'm saying? For for me to get you to roll and to get you out of here. You know and Man, it used to make me feel good, you know. But uh, then when the COVID kind of uh, when we got the vaccination and started uh, uh, taking taking the shots, it, then something else came up, you know. And it it, it, it just it's just it's just went my day, you know what I'm saying? It just went my day. But so it's a struggle. It made it challenging. But I kept my head up, you know. Um, I always say, uh, you know, you gotta uh, you, you walk by faith, not by sight. And with that, you can make it anywhere, and you can tolerate pretty much anything, you know. And uh, anything that you would like to tell the other states, 
that you think would be helpful when implementing changes for safety and patients and staff? Well, I would like to say, you know, um, you need to be, you need to uh, put the list more security on the, uh, the hospital because we have certain people that are trying to run up in here, you know, either they want to act like they want to admit themselves in here or um, uh, uh, start a riot or a fight with somebody, you know what I'm saying? So um, we have to be careful with those things or those issues that come about. Um, we have to uh, make sure we take our meds. For those who's uh, working, the, the staff, the staff, and they they own medication, they have to take their meds too to uh, be, you know, stay very uh, compliant with us, and we be compliant with them, you know, to be half function anyway. Um, I would say. Uh, It's uh, just be nice to each other. You know, it's all about attitude. Uh, and, uh, what, what can change the world is a smile. And the smile can, you know, change a lot of things. Make you feel warm all inside. Make you, make you feel powerful. It can give you hope. It can give you dreams. So don't turn my eyes down, you know. <laughs> mm, you know what I'm saying? Don't turn my eyes down. I would like to say, um, with that, have a nice day. Wow. Thank you so much. Very nicely done, uh, Carell and Charles. We appreciate you so much for speaking from the heart. And um, I also want to just uh, give a shout out to Wayne Beyer there, uh, the recovery support specialist at uh, Chicago Reed. Uh, for uh, your support and, and help in pulling this uh, together. And uh, with that, I think I'm uh, turning it back over to Tony in New York. Thank you. Thank you, Nanette. And thank you for the folks who just spoke. Um, I definitely have a smile on my face. So thank you for, uh, for reminding us all to smile. Appreciate that. Uh, so we have uh, two speakers from our Rochester Psychiatric Center. Uh, Rochester's uh, just about an hour east of Buffalo in New York. And uh, we have our first speaker is uh, Ozazi and our second speaker is John. So first up is Ozazi uh, Timothy, and he's going to talk about how facing COVID has had its ups and downs and that uh, how it's also been a period uh, not only of isolation, but also a period of personal development. So we'll turn this over to you, Ozazi. Oh, and I'm sorry, I just want to say thank you um, to, the, to, to our two panelists and also to Patrick Bailey. Patrick Bailey has been, um, we've, we've asked him to do several things, uh, this being one of them, uh, in order to help keep people connected to, uh, to the world um, via video teleconferencing and some focus groups and things that we've done. And uh, I know he gets asked to do an awful lot of stuff at the, uh, at the facility. Uh, you know, as a peer specialist, we often tend to get... Uh, asked to do uh, a wide variety of different things, have to wear a lot of different hats, and he has just been fantastic. So I just want to say thank you very much, Patrick, for all of your hard work. Um, and with that, uh, we'll, we'll now go to Osazi. Thank you. Hi, my name is Osazi Timothy. I'm a patient here at Rochester Civil Unit. I was from forensics. But the key thing, sure, I guess one of the few things I felt when the pandemic first occurred as I was thinking, it was like jail all over again because being in jail, I was isolated. You know, there were fights constantly. And I felt kind of like I was being incarcerated again. You know, technically I am incarcerated. And what happened was they stopped all the community visits so that you can't go on community jobs or family the first couple of months under the COVID. And it was very stressful. A lot of people get anxious. Uh, some people attack other people because they're so frustrated they were confined in one small space with no outlets. And if there were outlets, like the TV had to be shared, there were not that many books. Newspaper had to be shared. And 
how people don't have other quick other activities to engage themselves in so that they can distract themselves from the stress of being locked up with mental illness and the phase now pandemic. But I guess one of the things that COVID made life even better was that it helped people to be more sanitary. But before people, even the ASU patients, and not all the CPOs, but some of them, I don't have a name, they, uh, they have very atrocious behavior. Like someone will flush the toilet after they get out, but and other than wash their hands, but because of COVID, people will get on each other and say, hey, you gotta wash your hands, you gotta clean this. They'll clean up after it and stuff. And let's say, for example, take out the trash can, they did that automatically. When they did that automatically, it, it set the standard for everyone and people helping each other out. People who couldn't be by themselves necessarily or in that company a lot, but forced them to try to build academic skills like basic arithmetic, reading and grammar, and people are reading books. They're doing less TV watching. They're really trying to meditate. A lot of people weren't meditating at first because they thought it was like a waste of time. But now because of COVID, it forced them to meditate. People started to draw. They had other activities to do with themselves to improve themselves and understand who they are as a person, help cope with their mental illness. And in fact, it did help to some degree uh, people to be more in tune with who they were as illness and to be perfect more seriously. Now, that was some of the good part. And the other good part was that a lot of people did try to um, uh, be more um, appreciative of what they had. And it helped people to reach out to family and they said to contact one of the bad side about that with COVID was that people were confined. People who did have horrible hygiene practices were ostracized okay. and, uh, from the rest of the community and, and the, they became the outcasts amongst outcasts. And it was very sad, unfortunately. And what it also did is that some people thought it was a hoax that they weren't wearing their mask as much. I mean, the positive is people were forcing to wear their mask or so try to encourage them. You know, in fact, it was so bad that people weren't in their masks that they make an incentive for people who are the mask for the number of tickets to deserve privileges. People called out as free as they used to. Now they could, though, which is a plus. And the other side is that they weren't able to um, we reach out to family. And so they did virtual business. They did do inpatient in person visits, but they canceled because of the infection rate. And then some of the staff came up positive. And I know that these to get the point up. One of the units, one of the civil units, who had to be quarantined for like months, almost a year, because people kept showing positive with the testing that nobody had COVID. And uh, it just made people very anxious, made people very uncomfortable, made people act out. And there were a few fights because of that. So safety went, started to go down now, just a little bit, not too much. And uh, people started to really get anxious about who you know, just being in a combined space. And it brought my bad, it felt like I couldn't breathe that time because it was like so overwhelming. It reminded me of being in isolation and not feel, seeing anybody or touching anybody. I felt like you were staying in hell. It was like hell on earth for me at least, to some degree. But for, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, I think one of the interactions with staff and patients is that it was more positive. You know, staff was able to understand what the patient was asking for and they got to them. And the patients understand that staff wasn't their enemy, that they're in the same boat too, because they were both locked up together. But one of the things I would like to see is that if they could, um, number one, have where the, any schools like colleges, K-12 schools or trade schools could donate textbooks to, see, to uh, civil and forensic units. And if they could have like retired teachers retired professors and teachers or upcoming ones. There's two people on that come visit them and two of them so that they can develop academic skills so they can get high power job or if they can't get into traditional education, they go to their own business to teach them how to do a business program, make their own businesses, make their own uh, uh, facility, facility their own skills. They already have all that, just to enhance or to sharpen basic to more advanced skills. And then one of the things is, is that the hospital should try to make it they should try to ha ask the government, the governors to give them more money so in case of another pandemic was to happen or even an epidemic, they could be prepared for it and to tackle them before it gets out of control and have pretty safety precautions where people, if they had like a, uh, 
uh, if they had like issues with um, people being sanitized, try to isolate them first, wait until they're ready so they don't, because if someone gets COVID and they're not doing proper hygiene habits, everybody's screwed in the hospital. It just spread like wildfire. And uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much all I got. Thank you. All right, and then our last speaker today is John Justice. So he's going to talk about the real changes that COVID brought to his life. John, yeah. thank you. Hi, Tony. Okay, so how it felt when the pandemic first started affecting day-to-day -day activities in the hospital. For me, it was like, oh, hum, you know, like what's any different about this than a regular day? Because before COVID, the changes happened in March of last year, a whole year before that, we had been dealing with uh, uh, changes made by the ligature protocol. And so the hospital went through a complete upheaval with the ligature concerns. And they were just some of the most ridiculous changes that you could ever think of. And that there were not evidence-based practices. And it really, wreaked havoc on the treatment model here at the, at the hospital. So we had been dealing with those changes daily before we even got to COVID for a whole year. So by the time COVID came along and we got to make all these changes with COVID, it was like, oh, you know, it's nothing new, nothing new. But even like during the course of a day, let's say it's not COVID and it's not ligature, we, we deal with rule changes like three or four times a day on the wards anyway, because we don't have anything written in stone how a ward should be operated. So one staff member will say, this is the rule. And another staff member will come in and say, no, we're gonna do it this way. And then you have to know how to do things between each staff member and who does what each way. So for us, it really was not uh, all that big of a change. We've been dealing with those changes anyways before we got there. Yeah. What were the COVID uh, related changes that made life in the hospital better? Well, you know, one thing is that uh, our rehab staff were telling us pre-COVID that, well, because of the groups and the group schedule, we have to, we can only do, bring you outside two times a week. Well, COVID hits and, you know, voila, we're going to outside six times a week. So they have understood now that they can bring us outside, you know, a lot more than they have been. And so that's one of the positive related changes. There's no more debate about if they could do it or not because they have, they did it. And um, another uh, COVID related change that made life in the hospital better, uh, Osazi, you know, uh, hinted at it was that, yeah, it's a cleaner place. People are paying more mind to cleanliness, you know, cleaning tables and chairs and, you know, doing those things that um, our OCD people have been doing all along. So, it's, it's in a way like the OCD people have been vindicated <laughs> and, and the rest of the world is just catching up to us. Uh, so that's one of the other, other positive changes. It's a cleaner environment. And, um, and this is real. I have a lot of the OCD symptoms. We don't even get dinged for anymore <laughs> because that's what we're supposed to do. Like I'm gonna go to the Purell dispenser and take a whole bunch of Purell and wipe down a chair and table. I don't get yelled at from that no more because that's what you're supposed to do. Yes. COVID related changes that made life in the hospital more challenging. And other people have hinted at it too about groups. Uh, we, could, we could have less people in the groups. So you know, our, our limit was like eight or 10 for a group and nobody else could be let in. And so a lot of people had more downtime, all right? Um, and it got, the way that the wards were restricted it's, and add, add to the ligature concerns with that, it felt like they turned the clock 30 years on mental health treatment. I was at uh, Gwanda Psychiatric Center in the mid eighties, and that's how treatment was then. It was just a big room where people sat, there's one TV and they smoked cigarettes and drank coffee, nothing else going on. And, you know, to, to have the changes made, you know, for adding groups and rehabilitation and all the different things, it took a lot of years of lawsuits, a lot of changes by OMH, and these were just like swept away. All these liberty interests, the liberty interests that were just taken from us was just, you know, for stuff that was hard fought, hard won, and it was gone in, in the blink of an eye. So, and it's like they turned the clock back 30 years on mental health treatment. 
So that that made you know life more challenging, you know, in, in this environment. Yeah, and also the, the social distancing aspect of it when you're already communal living and you got a social distance. I'm like, what? Very hard, very hard to make that. You know, some of our people were doing anti-social distancing. 60 feet away <laughs> from people but <laughs> that made life more challenging it really did you know interactions between the staff and patients at the hospital during this time so like i said uh, all the the ligature concerns for the prior year before covid that was testing that was really not a good time for relationships between staff and patients it was really yeah bickering and fighting and all kinds of complaining, serial complaining, and it wasn't good. But by the time COVID came, we had just worked all that out. There was nothing, you know, we've been down this road before. So there's just more changes that, that are happening. And that's that we've, it, we've become accustomed to that. Our way of life is now just dealing with changes. And I don't know much how much dealing with changes we have to do or you know, or demonstrate, you know, to be moved forward in the system, but we've had our fill of it. We really have. We should be focusing on trauma, uh, psychiatric illnesses, symptoms, and medications. We should not be dealing with how do you deal with changes. We've had plenty of it, and we should really stop relying on that as a diagnostic tool. That is not a, that's not a diagnostic tool that really works. It's just crap. <laughs> you know? Anything that you would like to tell other states that you would think would be helpful when implementing changes for the safety of patients and staff? I would say uh, what we learned is that, especially with, with COVID, the liberty interests have been taken from us without process, without anything, stuff that was hard fought and won. If you're gonna take a liberty interest from us for our safety, then replace it with something else. Just don't have, all right, we're taking it and there's nothing in the void because that's what happened for a good amount of time there. Like you dialed back the clock 30 years on mental health treatment. If you're gonna take a liberty interest from us, replace it with something, you know, give something back. And uh, I, I think that would, 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 would help ease the pain with this and uh, be much more therapeutic than to say, you can't do this anymore. So that's what I got to say. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank, thanks, John. Thanks, Asazi. Uh, so with that, I will uh, pass it back over to Amanda, who I believe is going to do our Q&A. Yes. Um, so I'll, I have some comments from the chat that I'll read first. Um, and I encourage folks to, to share questions or comments for the panelists um, in the chat box. Um, so uh, one of the first comments was, hi, I have tears in my eyes. Thank you, Pilgrim panelists. You are awesome. Uh, from Bree, uh, um, uh, from Bree, amazing job, everyone, especially Michael. So proud of you. Uh, from Teresa Glaze, amazing job. From Neela, thank you for sharing your perspective. Um, from Michelle, thank you all to the panelists that bravely shared your story with us today, and thank you, Nashad, for um, organizing the event. Uh, thank you, Markeisha. Um, uh, this is from Michelle Vinson. Um, hello, everyone. On our own, Maryland is here for a large peer-run behavioral health advocacy and education organization with a network of peer recovery centers that we support. We're currently fighting the battle with expanding involuntary commitment standards in Maryland, despite many individuals staying stuck in the hospital for a very long time um, due to lack of resources. Uh, we'd love the opportunity to connect with any folks from Maryland who'd be interested in speaking more about this. Um, and Michelle's emails in the chat. Uh, from Joan, everyone affiliated with the program needs to hear uh, from the panelists profound insights. Uh, very nice job sharing your experiences at um, Elgin and Chicago Reed. Thank you all for sharing your experience and valuable feedback. So glad you're willing to share with us. Um, and then from that OCD is what we're supposed to do. I love it. Um, and so our first question um, and this to all panelists, what sort of things would you like to see replaced in the void of the liberties that were taken during COVID? What would help most to fill that space? Once again, what sort of things would you like to see replaced in the void of liberties that were taken during COVID? What would help most to fill that space? Oh, everybody's got their hand raised. Okay, why don't we start with uh, Wayne Rochester and then Markeisha. 
So I think we had a hand raised uh, over there at Chicago Reed. Was that you, Charles, with your hand raised? Or it was Correll? Go ahead, Correll. Yeah, I would like to bring them to change our visitation back to every day because some people can't make it here on our specific, uh, specific days they give us. And it should be an open visitation where it's any day you want to come, you can come. And I saw Mar uh, Rochester and then Marquisha. Yes, um, I would like to be able to use Zoom for court more often and for them to supply robes, gloves, shields for visitors so we could have visitation and, and masks. That's it. Okay. Rochester? Well, they can't, you know, they can't do like certain groups because, you know, social distancing or COVID concerns and stuff, maybe do one-on-ones or, you know what I mean? Something more personal, but, you know, just to have it with nothing, you know, like, well, you know, we can't take you guys out on furloughs, well, maybe take one person out of furlough or somewhere, maybe not, you know, outside or maybe that's restricted, but maybe somewhere in the building, you know, replace it with something. Just don't, just don't take it away and leave nothing. Um, and Pilgrim, and you're on mute. Hello, uh, I just wanted to say maybe they could change the visits, how we get food, maybe like a vending machine kind of thing. You know, people eat pizza, cheeseburgers, or something like that. I know it sounds far effects, but I just put something up, up in the air. And mm, that's it. Uh, uh, this is Tommy D from Pilgrim. Uh, pretty much. Just get our liberties and freedom back through the pandemic one step at a time, which administration here under Executive Director O'Keefe is doing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you got to have some patience. I was against the lockdown, but I've grown to accept it, and it was necessary because uh, it saved lives. Uh, we had uh, an older population here at uh, Pilgrim. And uh, some of them had pre-existing conditions, and if there was visits, they could have spread the virus. Uh, and <clears throat> we had to have the lockdown, and you, I had to grow through some growing pains. And uh, I just like to state that for the record. Thank you. Um, sure. Yeah, I'd like. To, this is a program. Um, I think that one of the really important things that we learned works in the hospital system over this time was uh, the fact that we could use tablets to connect with family and friends and also use this for uh, rehabilitation purposes like, uh, you know, get, uh, getting involved in AA over Zoom, like Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I can see that going into like a lot more you know, positive uh, fields, you know, like it could be, into, you know, micro groups and stuff like that. And I think it could be something that really makes the transition from the hospital setting into the uh, community. I'm making laugh. The last for your <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, the second question to all panelists is, what's the most important thing facilities can do differently if and when something like this happens again? Well, well I feel that you can, um, you know, since, since we've been through it already, we, we, we know the ins and outs. So uh, we, are, we are there well, much we prepared. We got the mask, we got the, uh, we got the vaccine, and, and we got, uh, we have the patience, you know what I'm saying? Not as far as people, but patience, meaning uh, uh, toleration, you know? So then, therefore, I feel uh, we can just uh, go with the flow because whatever is going to happen is going to happen. It ain't no need to try to stop anything, but we can't try to prevent it and just stay safe. You know what I'm saying? Keep our hands clean. Keep our, uh, uh, keep our showers and hygiene together. Uh, keep, uh, keep, keep our masks on, you know, and we got to do this on a daily, daily basis. And then, uh, you know, two or three times a day, four or five times a day, you know, whatever it takes, you know. Um, and especially, uh, we have to be motivated to, and, and within ourselves to uh, want to stay healthy. We can't let this illness get us down as far as 
our own mental illness get us down to the point where we don't want to take care of ourselves. Uh, when we want to lack on um, uh, just just on um, cleanliness and uh, keeping ourselves up. But uh, all we have to do is just uh, be prepared for that and uh, go about our day. Thank you. Uh, Michael. And then Michael. Right. Um, I think that one of the things that was, you know, should be continued in the future as well as it, you know, was in the past was the fact that the uh, clinicians and uh, staff were really open with us about what was going on with the COVID and, you know, they're, you know, with us, working with us right hand in hand as we went through it. Um, you know, there was transparency as to what was expected with, you know, quarantine and, you know, the regulations that the hospital set out. So I think that, you know, that was, you know, the hospital should take, uh, you know, just or an OMH, I guess, as a whole. Um, can just take a, you know, as a positive way to cope that, the way they did, because I feel like, you know, after being in two di different hospitals, um, you know, I think the situation was, you know, controlled as, you know, the best it, I guess it could be and, and without, you know, prior notice to uh, awareness of uh, how serious the pandemic mm -hmm. would be. Sure. Uh, local Marquisha, um, then Shanis, and then um, uh, Michael. Okay. Um, this is Marquisha from EMHC. I just need that um, the uh, administration would listen to the patients and the staff more because the staff come up with good ideas when they work so closely with us and they know what we need a lot of the times and go from there, but still stay, stay safe and prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back on over to Pilgrim. Okay, of course safety is first. So instead of taking so long, like the second wave came and it took longer, Boy, the first wave, we didn't take, we didn't have preparation. So you know it's going to happen. It's in inevitable that anything happen again. If it don't, please don't. Just be prepared for it. Because the first time when the uh, pandemic hit, it was like we had a you know a good time. And then the second wave came. People didn't know what to do. They had to create the, the vaccines. And another thing, like everybody mandatory to get vaccines so we wouldn't give it to each other, you know, on certain circumstances or however it works. But uh, yeah, everybody get vaccine and it'll be better. Thank you. Yeah. And Tommy, did you have something to? Uh, yes, Amanda. This is Tommy D from Pilgrim. Uh, pretty much what my uh, peers have stated is pretty much I agree with. and. Uh, from from Illinois, Maryland, and throughout the states that are listening, uh, it you're going to have some chaos in a pandemic, and I think we've learned a lot of lessons, and hopefully we've learned from it, and uh, we'll do better in the future. But uh, just uh, drive on, uh, live life, it's, it's, do the best you can in life. That's all. Thank you. Um, uh, another question, uh, what could the hospitals have in stock on the units to help with the downtime? Could you repeat that? Sure, of course. What could the hospitals have in stock on the units to help with downtime? With down what? Downtime. With downtime, like with, with free time. Uh, more uh, movies. We need we need uh, a lot of movies. You know, better selection of movies. That would that would help. You know, uh, kill some time. You know, more movies. Um, uh, Marquisha, and then uh, the folks from Pilgrim. I agree with Corel. Um, I believe that movies and videos regarding mental health and and how to stay safe and recovery and AA videos, whatever they have. Um, I think yeah. that would be very interesting for us to sit down and watch and learn from each other. Then we could have a session after and speak about what we learned and what we know about pandemics, what we know about mental health, what we know about recovery. Thank you. Back over to Pilgrim. 
Uh, this is Tommy D again. Uh, pretty much uh, our free time, we got a lot of fresh air. That was ver we were very grateful for that because a lot of us like fresh air. And uh, we uh, luckily we have technology here. And uh, and Tony Trahan and yourself, Amanda, for advocating your instrumental in uh, the tablets and uh, the iPads. We appreciate that very much. And uh, uh, the WebEx. Uh, computer apps and the more computers uh, pretty much just keep up with technology and uh, pretty much we were reading watching the go uh, governor Cuomo on uh, his news briefings pretty much we're finding out a lot of information there and and then uh, I think the first few the first like one or two months I think everybody was scared to come down to talk to us because the uh, Nobody knew uh, if you could catch the virus. We weren't wearing masks. So uh, once that uh, once that initial phase got through, uh, we we had our uh, op uh, director of operations, Steve Berg, pretty much come down and keep us in pretty much with his candor, keep in touch, and uh, he, he and he pretty much. Uh, he pretty much told us what was going on, and we weren't isolated. I think that's the most important thing, not to get isolated, because we're, we're stuck in here, and we have, we have to communicate between us and uh, the staff. It's very important. Yeah. Uh, Tim? Uh, what came to mind? Vocational training will be very good for us. Uh, on the downtime, uh, like like uh, Tom said, uh, activities with uh, tablets and iPads. Um, uh, when I was at Mid Hudson, they, it was like a radio in the room and a computer in the room. But like by the time I left there, I missed it. But you know, Bluetooth, uh, you know, technology like that with music, so you know, the literature list and everything of that nature. And vocational training the most. That's how I really think of it. Uh, yeah, my again, um, I think that there, you know, as of now, we have like, you know, music and you know, video and, and awards. And I feel like uh, there you know, should be more space for, you know, creative uh, endeavors, definitely, you know, like, maybe like art studio slash, you know, writing studio slash music studio, like just things where people can really tap into the uh, their creative, uh, creative side. Because I feel like sometimes you're, you know, you're almost isolated and forced to, like, you know, Listen to you know watch the sports or you know there's everyone watching that and stuff and I see a lot of people on the world writing doing writing and you know playing music and stuff. You've got a world plays guitar and I think that you know the awards should have like you know some, some access to that you know during our downtime as much as you know we can also the uh, you know courses the groups and stuff we do but more just in the free time. Uh, yeah, uh, this grill. I was thinking that it would be nice to have a computer on unit if we had access to our own personal computers where we could advocate for ourselves and do uh, FaceTime and Zoom with our counselors and uh, other people that's in our cases and our lives. That would be real helpful, very helpful. Mm -hmm. AA meetings, uh, religious services, a lot, of, a lot of good stuff on the internet. Thank you. And my Keisha. Okay, um, I was thinking we would receive boredom packets from our activity therapists, things like word searches and missing uh, uh, missing items in a picture or whatever. I would like to have more games that teach us how to stay healthy. Like they have different games that you could play bingo and it'll have schizophrenia on it or, or, or hearing voices, things like that, that we learn from that stay in our mind from our memory of uh, doing these things. Thank you. Um, a comment from Tiffany. Thank you uh, so much for sharing everyone. So meaningful. I was particularly struck by the comment about turning back the clock on mental health treatment. It helps to understand that this is how it may feel for some, you made a great point. It's an important historical perspective to keep in mind the advocacy that's taken place over the years of robust treatment and the feelings that might come up when, their peers, uh, to be, when they appear to be threatened by COVID restrictions. 
Um, and my apologies, uh, Rochester had their hand raised and I didn't see them. So um, I know Anthony, if you want to unmute them uh, for their comments. Oh, thanks, Amanda. Um, the, the, to the question about what to keep in stock for if patients are bored, here in Rochester, patients have the ability to purchase and maintain their own handheld video game consoles, as well as uh, full video game consoles in their own personal TVs to use under staff supervision. Access to that media has been so therapeutic and helpful during leisure times. Also, the hospital uh, maintains personal DVD players that can be signed out, handheld DVD players uh, for people to use, which was really helpful during the pandemic. Thanks. Apologies for not seeing uh, your hand raised before. Um, we have about six minutes, so I'm wondering if we should uh, just say some uh, uh, closing remarks. Um, I'll say a couple words and then throw it over to Tony and Nanette and anyone else. Uh, I just want to thank uh, the panelists again for, uh, for being so generous with sharing your time and your insights. Um, it really uh, helps us to to understand uh, better, and I, I think to highlight uh, uh, all of your resiliency, and this you know can be taken into account as as we move forward as a system. So I just um, I'm so grateful and um, having this connection now with uh, Illinois and New York, and I hope that we can have future sessions um, connect folks from other states um, and to hear their insights too. So um, I'll, I'll go to Tony and then Nanette. Uh, yeah, just echo what, what you said. You know, this has just been a, a, a wonderful experience. I hope that we can have more conversations directly with people uh, that receive services. Uh, although as advocates, you know, and former recipients of services were important, but, you know, nothing beats the, the, the real deal that's going on right now. And I, I want to thank everybody for uh, for their time, you know, we did have to spend time practicing this and whatnot, and uh, it, it did disrupt some of the some of the structure of the facilities, um, and uh, it did create some changes, uh, which was brought up. But uh, you know, everybody was really dedicated to doing this, and I think everybody just did such a fantastic job. And just thank you all mm -hmm. so much for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. This is Nanette. I just, uh, just so blown away. You know, I've worked in the system for about 22 years. And um, as uh, others who've been around for a while would know, this is uh, groundbreaking, absolutely groundbreaking um, on so many levels. <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, you know, so to to those of you who, um, who, who get, gave voice uh, from that inpatient experience, from an inpatient setting today, you did something that's never been done before. <laughs> so yep. just, you are incredible. You, you don't even know how amazing it is that you did this and that it is, it has been accomplished that you were, you were part, you were part of something that's never been done before. And, um, and, and for so many reasons, right? And for so many reasons, but it's not gonna be the last time because we've proven that it can be done. You know, you, you're you just breaking ground for all those that will follow you. And so, you know, I just want to give honor to all of you for breaking that ground, for being the first. It's not easy to be first. Look, <laughs> I've been first in a lot of things in this world of peer support, recovery, whatever you call it. It's not easy being first, but it is so rewarding being first because then you watch what gets opened up behind you and the doors that open for people that follow. And you guys, I'm just looking at your faces and I can't see Rochester's faces, but I can see the others of you whose faces are on and I'm just saying to you personally, Markeisha, to, to Carell, to Charles, to our friends at Pilgrim and our friends at Rochester, you're breaking ground today and we're so uh, just honored that you chose to do this, that you, you signed the papers, you said, yes, I'll do it. It might be scary, but I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna do it. And we're just, we're just so grateful that you've done it. And I, I, I feel so privileged to have been a part of it. Just, you know, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. 
Yeah, if, if I could add, Nanette, you took the words out of my mouth. It's exactly what I was going to say. This is groundbreaking. If there's one silver lining in the pandemic was the technology and for us to be able to do this, it is groundbreaking. It's been remarkable. Um, when we first started talking about this, remember we were like, are we gonna be able to get the hospitals to do this and to be able to get people to hook in and, and you guys did it and you were inspirational and I can, tell you that um, Nashbit is going to stay behind this, um, to look to you, um, to, to your division, um, to be able to guide us on what more we can do like this, because I, I think it's, um, it's, it's been phenomenal and it is a first, but we're not gonna make it the last. So thank you everyone. Thank you. So round of applause. Hey. Um, and and yes. Yeah. And thanks to everyone for joining us today.